What is baptism according to the scriptures? Well, that depends upon the context. The English word clearly brings to mind a religious initiation rite. The problem is that in the Greek language it only means to immerse. The verb is baptizo, or baptiz with some inflection for the verb or noun, where the bapt part means dip and is a word in of itself. The is, iota zeta ending, works just like for English I-Z-E, eyes, literally meaning dip pies, which would mean to dip something in a prolonged way, normally with intent to cause some kind of change in the thing. That corresponds to the English word immerse, and that is all the word means. In ancient Greek use of the word, I could say, you need to immerse the dirty dishes in that tub of soapy water for a while to get the dried on tomato sauce off of them. And by watching this video, you will be immersed into a simpler way of thinking about the word. What happened is that first, the Roman Catholic Church transliterated the word. And by transliterated, I mean created a new word in Latin by substituting Latin character for Greek character, sound for sound, to create a new, similar sounding Latin word, baptizo. Instead of translating it into a Latin word of equivalent meaning. So now this new invented Latin word was associated with an exclusively religious meaning having to do with the Christian initiation rite. They wrote that word into the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible in 405 AD rather than translating the word. If they had translated it instead of transliterated it, Latin already had words for immerse, which were amergo or amergo, which is obviously the Latin root from which we get the English word immerse. So now the Romans who spoke Latin, not Greek, and this was the end of the era of Koine Greek anyway, would see the word in their new Latin Bible as a special word and the Roman Catholic Church would teach them their doctrines surrounding it. John Wycliffe translated the Bible from the Latin Vulgate translation into English in 1380 using the Latin translation because he didn't know Greek. He transliterated that word again, this time from Latin to English. Tyndale followed suit in 1525 even though he was working from the original Greek and ever since then, the English translations have followed the tradition and used the word baptize instead of immerse. I can easily prove from the scriptures that the original Greek word does not necessarily refer to the religious initiation rite of immersing a person into water to mark their conversion to the faith. If you read Mark 7, 4 in your favorite translation, the Greek word baptizo is used twice. Let's try translating that using the English word baptize. And from the marketplace, except they should be baptized, are not eating, and many other things which they accept to be holding, baptisms of cups and vessels and copper dishes and couches. Notice all the things that get, quote, baptized, unquote, in the scripture. Even Jesus was expected to be, quote, baptized, unquote, again and again in Luke 11:38. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus was not first baptized before the meal, was surprised. Again, read that in your favorite translation. The same Greek word is used, but they didn't translate it using baptize, did they? So then, given the original word only means immerse, the obvious question, which will depend on context, is immerse into what? 
Because of the transliteration and creation of the religious word, the word baptize or baptism, there is now a mentality that each and every time you see the word baptism, it must refer to water baptism, except for the case where that the scripture says baptism in the Holy Spirit, which of course would be thought of as a special case, an initiation of spiritual baptism. If it does not say Holy Spirit, then it is wrongly assumed that it is water baptism by default, because baptism in English always refers to a ceremonial initiation rite. One of the serious doctrinal errors that we occasionally see, which depends on the prevalently ingrained assumption, is what is commonly referred to as baptismal regeneration. That error maintains that salvation is intimately linked to the act of water baptism as a sacrament. This was first taught as dogma by the Roman Catholic Church, and still is, but is still also taught by a few Christian sects, groups, and movements, although these other groups will normally take exception to the practice of infant baptism and a few other points, like permitting sprinkling as an alternative to full immersion. Otherwise, it is the same as what the Roman Catholic Catechism teaches, which you can actually look up on the Vatican's official website. Any doctrinal error has its collection of supposed proof texts, of course, and for baptismal regeneration, the first one is Acts 2.38. Let's look at that more closely. Peter commands his audience to, quote, repent, unquote, which is really the word metanoesate, which means change your minds, immediately followed by telling them to be immersed. Now that we have established that it is the general word immerse, you need to find out what they are to be immersed into. Notice that water is not mentioned anywhere here. There is a Greek word for water. It is udor in the Greek. If you wanted to say in water, date of case, you would spell it out en udati, but you will not find it there. Now, do you see the word ice? This is the word that literally means into. It is often figuratively translated for, but it positionally, literally, geometrically means into. When you read any kind of text, if the plain sense of the word makes sense, then seek no other sense, lest you end up with nonsense. So, let's see if the plain sense makes sense. What are they to be immersed into? Look at the next two words. Aphesen amartion that is, pardon of sins. So, we have the complete concept. Be immersed into pardon of sins. Now, I know what you're still thinking. Immersed into water for the pardon of sins. No, it doesn't say that. The whole phrase is, Be immersed, each of you, upon the name of Jesus Christ, into pardon of sins sins. To better understand the context, remember what the Jews at Pentecost had just asked Peter. One verse before, after Peter testified to the resurrection and told them that God makes this Jesus, whom they crucify, Lord and Christ, the Jews were cut to the heart and asked, what shall we be doing? Now remember, they considered themselves under the law of Moses. They were works-focused. The law of Moses prescribed what they should be doing and should not be doing, all in the interests of doing right and shunning what is evil. 613 rules produced an ever-present sin consciousness in them, 
so that they would always be seeking out how to obey the law of Moses and avoid sinning by disobeying it. Up until this time, they were all immersed into the law of Moses. In fact, the scripture says that they all immersed themselves so as to be immersed, that's Greek middle voice, into Moses. That is what 1 Corinthians 10.2 says. No, the Israelites were not immersed in water. They passed through the Red Sea without getting wet. Pharaoh and his army were immersed in water. They were immersed into the Red Sea and drowned. 1 Corinthians 10.2 says the Israelites were immersed into Moses. Moses standing for the law of the Old Covenant, since the law was given through Moses. So, these men at Pentecost, immersed into Moses, are asking what they should be doing now, given this new revelation about Jesus. But, they are not going to be able to do anything more than what Jesus just accomplished on their behalf. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses, putting an end to it. Now there would be a new way of thinking. Now they would be immersed into that which Jesus did for them, which was to pay for their sins. Now they will be, as we are, immersed into forgiveness of sins. That is the change of mind or change of thinking that they are told to have when Peter says, quote, repent, unquote, which is, as I said, Really, metanoesate, change your minds. I wrote an article that goes into Acts 2.38 in much more depth and pulls the rug out from under the Roman Catholic thinking. Let's go on to the second most used proof text, which is 1 Peter 3.21. I wrote an article devoted to that, too. In short, 1 Peter 3.21 does indeed mention water, and it talks about immersion. The problem is, the water that 1 Peter 3.21 talks about is the water of the flood, which the wicked were literally immersed into, causing them to drown and die. You don't want that baptism. Noah and his family were not immersed in this water. They weren't even sprinkled. They didn't even get wet. They floated on top of the floodwaters, completely dry, inside the ark, while the wicked were being immersed, or baptized, if you will, to death. We, however, are being saved by the anti-type of this flood immersion, which is literally the effect of the appeal to God of a good conscience. And it does literally use the word anti-type, antitupon. Again, the baptism that 1 Peter 3.21 is talking about, if you want to call it that, is not associated with that appeal of a good conscience. It is associated with the wicked being drowned in the flood. You don't want that baptism for sure. The third verse used as proof text for baptismal regeneration is John 3.5. There it says that if anyone is not begotten out of water and of spirit, he is not able to be entering into the kingdom of God. There we see also that water is mentioned. But let's look what is not. Baptism. The word immerse is not in there. In context, Jesus compares natural birth which is out of water, with spiritual birth, in response to Nicodemus asking how a man can enter his mother's womb a second time to be born. There are several other baptismal regeneration proof texts, but you should get the idea by now and not assume the Roman Catholic paradigm. In summary, if you translate the word instead of transliterating it, and don't assume that it is always or primarily referring to water. And then read it in context. You will get what the scriptures really mean. But you'll have to take off your Roman Catholic glasses first.